This is Our View, brought to you by the people who work for you, the proud members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. House Bill 1584 was offered to the legislature this session and many Federation members saw it as the opening shot of another attack on our state's institutions, the institutions that care for the most fragile of our citizens. We respect the intentions behind the bill, but it's the wrong way to go about assessing the future of our institutions for the mentally ill, the developmentally disabled, juvenile offenders, veterans, corrections, as well as the school for the deaf and the school for the blind. Here's why we feel this way. House Bill 1584 would set up an autonomous super commission to quote, consolidate, expand, close, replace, or retain, unquote, any and all state institutions. House Bill 1584 explicitly excludes any frontline workers or their families and the union from having a representative on the commission. Only one public hearing would be required. Extremely troubling to us is that this Super Commission's decisions would be nearly veto-proof. Uh, also, it's, it's been said uh, here regarding uh, new section 5, uh, sub 1, the best quality of care uh, is, is a consideration, but then it goes on, it actually limits that. It, it doesn't expand that, it limits it. It's based on state laws and policies. It's not based on science. It's not based on, on absolute quality of care. It's limited. It's limited to existing laws, and it's uh, limited to existing policy. Now, you know, that policy led to the closings at Furcrest where 57 people left. Three died in very short order. You know, we're talking about relocating uh, behaviorally and medically fragile people, and that's a very dangerous process. I've worked on this issue um, covering institutions, facilities for over 25 years in 20 states for both my international union and the Washington Federation of State Employees. In that, in that time, in those 25 years, I've never seen a governor or a legislature abdicate their role regarding these facilities. The approach out, outlined in this bill essentially washes the legislature's hands clean of any re responsibility so legislators are no longer politically uh, responsible. The rage for some time, as Representative Melosha knows, has been to hold government more accountable and to run government more like a business. Smart business persons would talk to their line workers and get their input. The workers in all of these f facilities provide essential services to our state's most vulnerable citizens. If you want to know how to care for these individuals in the future, we, you should talk to the workers. Come out and visit those facilities. What's missing from this is the input from the doctors, the professionals, the psychologists, the social workers, the therapists. You know, those, are, those are the issues that need to be looked at uh, very carefully. When the State Labor Council held its annual legislative day, our governor was the main speaker. She spoke about job growth, education, and health care. I'm excited. Our ports are doing amazing work. Uh, we are literally the gateway of products coming in and products going out uh, of the fine work that's being done in Washington State. If you were, if you were a, a governor from Washington State, you'd find that you could go into Beijing, China, on a trade mission to sell Washington products fly in on a Boeing airplane, travel to your uh, hotel and go past a skyscraper called Microsoft, get to your hotel, look across the street at, yes, a Starbucks, and then go down the street and visit a Costco with amazing Washington products throughout that store, just like we have here in Tumwater. That's what we need. That's our economic future. Those are the kind of jobs, not jobs shipped out someplace, but jobs brought in that are good, family wage jobs with health care benefits and retirement opportunities for our people. The biggest issue, I think, the biggest challenge to making that happen, I have to be honest with you, I think is education. If we don't have the skilled, trained workforce, we cannot compete in the global marketplace. I've learned a lot in the last 18 months about our education system in this state, and I've seen the challenge around the world. 
I am absolutely shocked that today, 50% of our students who enter kindergarten are not ready to learn. What happens to that child? That child gets shoved along, gets frustrated, falls further and further behind, and drops out. That is a huge loss of opportunity for that child and for all of us. So we're going to turn our attention to early childhood education because we believe every child's born learning and that we ought to give every child the opportunity to succeed in school and succeed in life. And you know, I've, I've said this to you before and I firmly believe it. Health care is in a crisis in this country. It's a crisis from a moral perspective, which I think ought to say it in and of itself. It's in a crisis because it's going to put us at an economic disadvantage if we don't get our arms around health care in this country. It's a national crisis, and yet there is nothing, nothing going on in Washington, D.C. in order to do the right thing by the people of this country. We're the wealthiest country in the world. We do not get the highest quality health care. We don't even get return on our investment let alone millions who are uninsured, many more who are underinsured. And what I have heard when I've traveled the state, those who even have it are afraid they're going to lose it. They're afraid they'll be dropped. They're afraid that if somebody in their family gets a diagnosis, they will see bankruptcy. That's just fundamentally wrong. I will say it again. I do not believe we should think of health care as something for the rich. It is a right to every Washingtonian and every American in this country. Federation members know how to stand tall, and we salute those working brothers and sisters around America who also stand up to unfairness at the workplace and disregard for social justice. We salute Ask Me Brothers and Sisters of Local 3299 in San Diego. They're not afraid to tell administrators at the University of California San Diego Medical Center that pension and benefit takebacks wasn't going to be part of their future. Ask Me members from around California descended on the center and said a message that with minimal raises and the increased cost of living, workers can't afford to have more and more taken from their paychecks. American and European workers who have to compete with low-wage workers in China see the solution as helping those workers organize. According to the AFL-CIO's representative in Paris, Chinese companies, by design, don't keep their workers long enough to get settled, and the society will someday face serious social issues. They have a very serious problem in China. And, and, and I saw it uh, in December when I had an opportunity to, to tour a little bit outside of Hong Kong into the mainland, where I drove around industrial parks. Industrial parks meaning 100,000 workers for various factories. And the job age of the workers is 15 to 24 at max, 24 at max. And when they reach 24, 25 at age, they're let go. They're gone. They're finished. They send back, they send back to the countryside. What do they do in the countryside? That's a major issue for China. And indeed, it is the question of the Chinese economy and the global economy. What do they do? What do we do? How can we help them? How can, how can they help the global economy? That's really a question. And it's, it's not just an issue of, of multinationals, but it's also a, a issue, an issue of, of, of uh, Chinese companies and, and other companies that are involved in this process of basically it's, it's export work. We are in a new age where learning is constant. And of course, there is an issue of lifelong learning in the workforce everywhere. And it's a challenge that I don't think the Chinese have yet understood. And that's possibly a real fault in the system. 
and perhaps they don't understand it or they don't yet realize it. But it is an issue in which uh, I think that, that we'll have to come to, to bear at some point in time where we're going to be dealing with a globalized economy in which we have to deal with a matter of, of ages, generations, lifelong learning and succession, and retirement, and the process of planning for that process. So this is something that is going to require a long-term political will. A look at our union history. Here's Ross Reeder. Nearly 40 years before the first permanent European settlement in North America, Spanish explorers brought enslaved Africans to what is now the Carolinas. On April 26, 1526, the Africans escaped in what is the first recorded slave revolt in North America. Around 1570, near Veracruz, Mexico, still North America, Gaspar Yanga, said to be a member of the royal family of Gabon, came to be the head of a band of revolting slaves. Escaping to the difficult highlands, he and his people built a small free colony. For more than 30 years it grew, partially surviving by capturing caravans and bringing goods to Ver Veracruz. However, in 1609, the Spanish colonial government decided to put an end to the community. On the morning of September 9, 1739, the largest slave uprising in early America began near the Stono River, 20 miles from Charleston, South Carolina. Slaves gathered, raided a firearms shop, and headed south, killing more than 20 whites as they went. Other slaves joined the rebellion until the group was about 60 strong. Whites set out in armed pursuit, and by dusk, half the slaves were dead and half had escaped. Eventually, more were eventually captured and executed. The slaves may have hoped to reach St. Augustine, Florida, where the Spanish were offering freedom and land to any fugitive. White colonists quickly passed a Negro Act that further limited slave privileges. However you define slavery, we can clearly see that revolt is a fine tradition at which we should not sneer. You have been watching Our View, the voice of Washington's working families. We remind you, when you accept a paycheck for your hard work, you don't give up your rights. Thank you for watching.